Creating a studio is way more than just knowing what color lights to put up or what sort of couch or something to get. I made a lot of choices, including the colors that I chose, the types of lighting, the positioning of the camera, even the lenses that I've used, the positioning of this microphone, really hinges on why I'm creating this content in the first place. Woo! Hey, it's Kevin Shen here. Thanks so much for dropping by. So after releasing my Camera Basics speed course as an attempt to just figure out a way to make this channel sustainable, a lot of you have been asking me how I created this YouTube studio that I'm filming in right now. So I thought I'd make a video for you to explain how I built this studio and the decision making behind each thing. So for those of you here who've been following me for a while but aren't really here and interested for the camera stuff, don't worry, you won't hurt my feelings. You can skip this video, but if you do, please make sure to check out some of these other videos. Anyways, with that said, let's jump into it. I hope you learned something. So there's four parts to this process. The first one being to really know why you're creating content in the first place. A lot of tutorials, they jump straight into the doing, but they don't cover the decision-making process of why they chose to do things a certain way. And that's where I wanted to start with today because creating a studio is way more than just knowing what color lights to put up or what sort of couch or something to get. It's about knowing what sort of feelings you wanna to convey to your audience, why you wanna be creating the certain content that you're doing. And it, that gives you a kind of a framework to kind of figure out step by step what sort of decision making you should have from that point forward. So for me, the type of content and the emotional message that I wanna convey is kind of like that of a campfire sort of setting where you're talking with people on a deeper intimate level. So for that reason, I made a lot of choices, including the colors that I chose, the types of lighting, the positioning of the camera, even the lenses that I've used, the positioning of this microphone really hinges on why I'm creating this content in the first place. And beyond that, on a more tactical level, you're gonna wanna figure out what you're gonna be using your space for. If you're shooting interviews, that might mean you need more space than if you're just shooting me as one person. If you're gonna be shooting product shots on a table, you might need even less space. So now part two, laying out your space and very specifically where you're gonna put your camera and how much space you need. If you're looking for that really nice blurred background look, what we call shallow depth of field, you're gonna wanna be very, very intentional about how much space you have between your camera, your subject and your background, as well as the choice of lens that you pick, the focal length of that lens and knowing what your sensor size is on your camera because all of those things affect the field of view that you have, as well as the amount of blur that you're able to get based on those distances. So that's what we're looking at here in step two. The farther away your background is from your subject, the more out of focus that background is gonna look. And likewise, the closer I, the subject, am to the camera, the more out of focus that background is gonna be. Oftentimes when you want to get that nice cinematic professional look, you want your background to be as out of focus as possible. So to figure out how much space you're gonna to need to get that nice soft blurry background, you're gonna also want to take into account what lenses you have available. Are your lenses super wide? Are they super tight and narrow? What sort of focal lengths are you playing with? The lenses you have available are going to dictate how much space you have to play with to get the right framing of the shot that you want. A wider lens is gonna make your subject look way bigger, but the background's gonna look smaller. A narrower lens is gonna make the subject look the same size if you pull back far enough, but the background is gonna look way expanded. That's more about lens compression stuff. I talk about that in the course as well. But essentially what you need to know here is have an idea of which lens you wanna be using in your studio setup, and then have a friend stand at certain places to test out how much space do you need between the camera and your friend to get the frame that you want, because what you're gonna be doing now is using that information to sketch out for yourself how you wanna lay out that studio. Say you have a rectangular room like I do, I specifically chose to lay everything out lengthwise because I wanted to maximize the distance between that back wall and me, the subject right here. So be very intentional about it as you're sketching this out. And once you have an idea of what looks best, knowing that is gonna give you the constraints that you get to work around to design your space in the next step. Also, as you're doing that, keep in mind, step four is gonna be lighting, stuff like this. 
You're gonna wanna make sure that you have enough lateral space as well to place a few lights. Light stands typically have a wide base because they have to support a lot of heavy things. So keep in mind that your light won't be flush against the wall. They might have to jut out. Like this giant light right here is about three feet deep. So I had to allot that much space on that side of it as well. So just another small factor to keep in mind as you're designing the layout of your space. Step three is actually setting up the studio. Now that we have an idea of how much space we need in the rough layout, we can start to set up the actual space itself. Be very, very intentional about the colors that you choose to design your space with. And there are two factors that ultimately come into play here. Number one, the overall on-screen image. This is where color theory kind of comes into play. You want to be very deliberate about what colors appear in your studio because that's gonna set the tone for the emotions that come into play as people experience your content. I personally chose to play with the colors of like teal and orange, or I guess you could say blue and yellow, because in color theory, there is this concept of complementary colors. Colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel tend to pair really well together. So you could in theory pick any two colors that, that are opposite each other on the color wheel and they would look really good. However, there's one thing to keep in mind. Human skin tones are all variations on a narrow band of that spectrum between yellow and orange. And so that's why a lot of designers and also Hollywood films tend to play with the color scheme of teal and orange or yellow and blue because it plays very well with human skin tones, creating a very cohesive look. And secondly, you just wanna pick colors that are gonna be cohesive to your brand as well. Now this might be obvious, but you wanna make sure that your branding is consistent between the graphical elements like the banner on your YouTube site, your website, and the, the stuff that's happening on screen in your studio. And so for me, in my particular case, I had a sort of a blank slate. I quit my job about six months ago to try to build a sustainable YouTube channel around trying to show people they matter through video. And I was still experimenting, so I could play around with a much wider range of options. So now applying that to the studio design. In a movie, a director's job is to direct the audience's attention. And in the design world, the job of a designer is to guide the user's eye. We want to cast attention on the subject rather than the background. We want to highlight the person that we're interviewing, us ourselves if we're in the video, or the product that we're showcasing. And so we can do that with a variety of tools. Things like warm colors, bright colors, or things that are in more sharp focus, tend to draw the eye way more than cool colors, darker colors, or things that are out of focus, which makes them appear to recede farther into the background. So be very intentional about that. I might do a more in-depth tutorial on this in the future from my days doing user experience design, but for now, that's really all you need to know. So that being said, consider painting your wall. A generic beige whitish wall is the telltale sign of an amateur video. Putting a little bit of effort and attention to detail really makes a difference here. My style is that I like to connect on a real meaningful human level. And so that's why I actually personally recommend going with a darker color. That kind of helps to set the subconscious mental state of the audience. It's like being at a campfire. You feel like you can relate better with people. There's also, you know, the argument to be made for choosing a lighter background, but for me that just feels a little bit more sterile. Next, and this is a big part, we wanna add lights to the background. Having lights in the background that are out of focus gives you what we call bokeh, which is the out of focus specks of light that turn into these really nice looking spots of deliciousness. These things, these things. All right, switching to iPhone view right now. I've got these two things hanging from Ikea. This thing is a really cool little light thing. It just adds a lot of accent. And I like it because it's number one, it's a, well, it's an LED light, so it doesn't kind of run hot. Number two, it's this big light source. It's not just a tiny point light. It's this kind of like a big outline thing of that, that filament. So that, that adds like a really cool glow when it's out of focus, makes the glow and bokeh kind of bigger. It's also really orange, which fits with the orange and teal look that we're going for. That's the spotlight. And here is the other, Ikea light, everything is actually mounted to the ceiling with these trigger clamps right there. So these are 600 pound trigger clamps that have 600 pounds of force going this way, going across the beam. And that provides just enough grip for me to mount these things, especially on this one. This is pretty heavy. Two lights and string it across with a switch over here. We've got this rigged up all the way up top. It's got a command hook right up there. 
and then it plugs into an extension cord which just runs along the wall over to this thing. Personally, as an artistic choice, using that in the background helps to accentuate and really call attention to how blurry the background is. You also wanna add lights to the background to cast shadows across it. Adding shadows to certain things allows you to create texture, to create depth. Depth is what makes things visually engaging. So adding a little bit of a shadow going across something really helps to sell and bring people into that uh, visual experience. And finally, you can also use lighting to shine against your background. See what I have right here? It's just a LED light panel with a blue gel in front of it. So it casts a bluish teal light against the wall. And it has this really cool effect of being able to separate me from the background in this really cool way that I, I kind of like. So make sure you're adding lights for this variety of reasons. Have fun with the lighting, be experimental and just play around with different things and see what happens. All right, so now part four, the lighting. Now we're not talking about background lighting, we're talking about actual lighting for lighting the subject. This is where we make you look like a freaking movie star. A key aspect of what makes an image look compelling and engaging is how well it shows depth. Lighting is a crucial, crucial way in adding depth to your shot. 